Hey everybody, welcome to the grand opening of Found Flicks Video, where I'll be your tour guide to all the best and weirdest horror and cult films, along with some personal favorites of mine that deserve more recognition. The idea here is to evoke that glorious era of perusing a video store and discovering something truly special in the aisles that made a big impact on me. And today's selection perfectly fits the bill. 1985's vampire horror comedy, Fright Night. You know, I was racking my brain trying to remember the first time I saw saw this. Must have been late at night on cable, which is appropriate, but what I definitely do vividly remember is seeing the cover when browsing the aisle at my local Blockbuster. Rest in peace. It always caught my eye with that distinct and, well, kind of freaky style. And I definitely remember turning over the box to read the synopsis, and when seeing the vampire's name in the film was Jerry Dandridge, I was always like, wow, that's my last name. I'm like a vampire too. What an idiot. Regardless, over the years, I grew to love the movie for a variety of reasons. It's able to be a perfect amalgamation of being reverential to the past era of horror, featuring the likes of Peter Cushing and Vincent Price, and also works admirably at updating the classic vampire tale into a new, more modern 80s mold, which is, of course, nearly 40 years old now, and is a perfect encapsulation of that time period. In particular, the idea of being a teenager and catching weird old horror movies late at night on cable, and essentially finding out that some monsters are indeed real. This is writer-director Tom Holland's directorial debut, who's perhaps best known for Child's Play a few years later, but for me, it's Fright Night that is unquestionably his greatest work. You can just tell that this guy is a longtime hardcore horror fan, and manages to balance being an homage to the old while also having a lot of fun in updating the concept. And while it is unquestionably funny, it also contrasts this with several actually quite scary intense scenes that all work together well as a whole. Additionally, a big part of why the movie works so well is the perfect cast. At the forefront, you have William Ragsdale and Amanda Bierce as the quintessential kid-next-door teen couple, and they both embody that style Holland is evoking well. Although it's really silver screen legend Roddy McDowell, I mean this guy was in almost 300 things, as the down-on-his-luck horror actor turned TV host Peter Vincent that adds a real spark to things. And he is absolutely perfect in bringing to life that vibe and attitude of a long past his shelf date actor. And even his character's name is a combination of the aforementioned Peter Cushing and Vincent Price. However, who really steals the show and practically drips sleazy charm in every single frame he's in is Chris Sarandon as the sharply dressed vampire Jerry Dandridge. Much of the lore here is taken from the OG of Vampire Stories Dracula by Bram Stoker, but again is updated in many ways with an 80s attitude and style. Now instead of the classic cape, Jerry and instead dons a long, sweet coat. He revels in every moment and adds so much life to the film, it's honestly one of the best vampire portrayals of all time in my opinion. And it's just so damn sensual too. I mean, his theme from the movie called Come To Me is one of the most memorable themes in horror. A bombastic slice of sexy sense and shredding guitar courtesy of Brad Fidel, also responsible for the very different score to Terminator 2. Another big aspect we'll be focusing on in this show is special effects. There's just something transcendent about practical effects, in particular from the 80s, and Fright Night boasts some absolutely killer makeup and gore. And I always have a deep respect for what these guys do. They're truly artists, literally crafting monsters and nightmares out of plaster and paint. And it's just a personal touch that feels really missing from computer graphics of today. And here, the legendary Richard Edlund and Steve Johnson provide some excellent rubber, both having just come off another 80s classic you might have heard of, Ghostbusters. Yeah, probably probably heard of that one. And Fright Night even used a discarded monster prop from Ghostbusters, which is pretty interesting, and we'll talk about that later. So join me, won't you, as we look in depth at these aspects and much more about this classic, as we journey into the terrifying and hilarious world of Fright Night. As Jerry says near the end, welcome to Fright Night. 
for real with a little sassy arm thing and everything. Sorry, always wanted to do that. Starting with a lengthy series of shots, we find ourselves immersed in a suburban neighborhood, hearing a TV playing an old Dracula film featuring Peter Vincent Vampire Hunter. Just about to feed, he puts a stop to the vamp, triumphantly introducing himself before taking care of business. All of this already creating such a distinct tone and feel, it's giving me the tingles. Speaking of tingles, young Charlie Brewster and his girlfriend Amy are in the midst of some light petting. He keeps trying to make the big move, but she's hesitant, distracting him with the return of the low-budget local horror show, Fright Night. Host Peter introducing the film Blood Castle. Hmm, sounds pretty good. Charlie is overwhelmed by his festering teenage hormones, and Amy gives in, saying she's just scared is all, suggesting that they get in bed. But he is drawn to the window by something quite curious. Two men next door wheeling in a coffin into the basement, instantly forgetting all about poor Amy, who leaves annoyed and rejected. Way to go, Charlie. He chases after to try and apologize, but again is more interested in his new neighbor's activities, barely mustering a response when she says goodnight. His mom first chides him for his behavior with Amy, and when asking about who is moving in, she doesn't know much. Seeing on the news someone was recently murdered. Could it be tied to his mysterious new neighbor? You betcha! The next day at school, we discover Charlie ain't the best student, complaining to his goofball buddy, Evil Ed, about bombing a pop quiz because he wasn't prepared. Ed ribbing him that that's like the whole point. Seeing Amy nearby, he calls out to her, but still upset, she runs off without responding. Back home, pulling up in his half-painted classic Mustang, he sees a spicy visitor roll up in a taxi. Asking for the address, Charlie informs her that it's next door. The boy staring like a total cornball as she saunters towards the house. He at least applies himself to do some studying, holding up in his room, a nice breeze coming in through the window. Nice and relaxing. Until he hears a woman screaming from next door, which definitely doesn't sound good. And the next day, he gets his first confirmation something is amiss with his new neighbor. At school, Amy tries to reconcile after their argument, but as usual, he's pulled away by the news, learning that a woman's mutilated corpse was recently found. Indeed, the same woman he saw going into the house next door. Ed chimes in that it's the second murder in two days, both having had their heads chopped off, giggling like an absolute doofus. Amy is even more pissed at Charlie now, shoving a sloppy joe into his face. As the processed meat dribbles down his chin, Ed cackles, you're so oh, you're cool, so Brewster. Cool, Brewster. <laughs> and just like that, a classic one-liner was born. Now certain something is up next door, Charlie sneaks over to get a closer look, seeing a man, Billy, blacking out the windows. Charlie is lured towards the basement where he saw him putting the coffin, but gets stopped in his tracks by Billy telling him to buzz off. Later that night, Charlie is perched at the window, waiting for some kind of a sign, eventually passing out in a ding-dong and Fritos fueled slumber. He's startled awake by some deadly and sensual guitar riffs. Seriously, I love this theme that they have. A woman goes to the window, undoing her top, and is joined by a taller gentleman, seeing he has fangs. Just about to bite down, he sees Charlie watching them, and closes the blind, seeing he also has some unusually long nails when pulling down the curtain. Charlie freaks, running to his mom, exclaiming the guy next door has fangs. He then spots Billy running up to the house, Charlie hiding in some shrubbery as he drags out what is clearly a body from the house to the back of his Wrangler. Coming down from a POV shot, we take flight, Jerry then appearing, tossing Billy her purse, warning that he's forgotten something. Charlie's mom comes out yelling in confusion for her boy, who does his best to remain silent. But Jerry can sense he's there, tossing his half-eaten apple right in front of Charlie's hiding spot, sending him fleeing back inside. Naturally, Charlie is already Already convinced that Jerry is a vampire, but his mom and Amy understandably have a hard time believing his wild story. He's adamant that he has to do something wanting to call the police, but relents to leave out the potential vamp aspect of things, just the two murders. He returns with a homicide detective, greeted by Billy, who warmly invites them inside. When asked about Jerry's whereabouts, he vaguely says he's out on business. Asking about the victim Charlie saw, Billy says no one else was in the house, Charlie angrily blurting out that that's a lie. He digs through some covered belongings finding an old painting of a woman that looks just like Amy. But how can that be? Just as in the original Dracula story, Mina was a reincarnation of the Count's long-lost love. And it certainly appears to be the same with Amy. Hopefully he doesn't get to meet her, that probably won't go well. Charlie demands to let them see in the basement, certain that Jerry is down there asleep in his coffin. But both just laugh at him, immediately getting dragged out, assuming this is all a stupid joke. Way to go, Charlie. Still adamant with the detective that it's true, he's not having it warning he'll throw him in jail forever. Wow, forever, that is serious. And it looks like Charlie
Charlie won't be getting help from the law with his neighbor. Where else to turn but his horror movie loving pal Ed, worried that Jerry could come and attack him tonight and needing some tips on what to do, offering eight bucks for his expertise. Ed doesn't know that much, but does know vamps don't like crucifixes, but informs him that in order for it to work, one has to have faith. There's also, of course, garlic and holy water as well, but that's about all he's got. What a waste of eight bucks. Thanks for nothing, Ed. Though he does have one final piece of info that is his best bet at protection. A vampire can't enter a home without being invited in first. Well, phew, as long as no one invites him in, Charlie should be fine. But of course, while he's busy nailing up his windows, his mom calls him from downstairs that there's someone for him to meet. It's Jerry in his house his mom having naively invited him over for drinks. Charlie befuddled and terrified by this development, and Jerry rubs it in, coyly offering now that he's been invited over, he'll probably drop over quite a bit. Oh, great. Charlie backs away, mumbling about needing to get back to his homework, Jerry leaving him with a threatening, see you soon. Later that night, Jerry makes his move, Charlie clutching a crucifix, awakened by loud bangs on the roof all around him, and following some odd scratching sounds, is relieved to find it's just branches hitting the window. While upstairs, his mom has a visitor, Jerry looming over her while she sleeps. He's only interested in Charlie, though, breaking the knob so that she can't get out, and descends upon Charlie's room, whistling strangers in the night. Ooh, appropriate. He hides in the closet and waits for Charlie, sneaking up right behind him, grabbing him by the throat, and telling him to keep it down, not wanting to wake up his mother, but then just straight throws him across the room into the closet, which I'm sure would wake anybody up. Jerry chides him for causing him so much trouble, telling him he deserves to die, but offers him a choice. Forget about him, and I'll forget about you. Charlie foolishly rebuffs his offer, reaching for his crucifix, but Jerry moves it away, deeming him a fool. He easily opens the nailed window, pulling Charlie down towards the nails, causing a photo of Amy to fall out and shatter right onto a wooden fence post. How's that for some nice symbolism? He manages to stab him in the hand with a pencil, Jerry reverting to his true vampire form, which is pretty gross looking. Apparently it would take up to nine hours to get Jerry into his full makeup here, and Chris Sarandon, a consummate professional, would be so bored that he would actually help them put on his vampire nails. Now that's that's a good, good actor. He yowls, blasting Charlie back against the wall, their scuffle interrupted by Charlie's mom banging on the door, and Jerry escapes via the window, Charlie telling his mom it was just a nightmare, ushering her back to sleep. Yeah, but what about the closet? I'm sure she's gonna notice that, probably. He tries to calm down after their encounter, but Jerry calls, letting him know that this is far from over, telling him that he started it, and now he's got to finish it, leaving their next encounter for tomorrow night. Sweating bullets and having no idea what to do, a radical idea pops into his head. Watching Fright Night, Peter Vincent returns, blatantly saying that he believes in vampires and knows that they exist because he's fought them in all their guises in his movies, proudly declaring that he's always won. That's why he's regarded as the great vampire killer. And so Charlie decides to try and enlist Peter's help, as certainly he must know all about how to fight the undead. He tracks him down to the studio, where it seems things aren't going too well, mentioning that his show got canceled, as kids nowadays aren't interested in the classics, but more into ski mask wearing killers stalking virgins. Take that, Friday the 13th. Initially, he does play along that he believes, until he realizes that Charlie isn't messing around. And he quickly excuses himself, the boy still pleading for him to listen as he drives off. Well, that didn't go well, and Charlie is clearly becoming more and more obsessed. Found in his room by his friends, candles and crosses everywhere, in the midst of whittling some steaks. He explains his plan is to wait for Bill to leave and kill Jerry before he gets the chance tonight. Amy calls it murder, but he clarifies that you can't kill what's already dead. They're both concerned about his mental state and going alone, so they too suggest getting Peter's help, offering to try to convince him themselves, and getting Charlie to promise to not go without them. We get a better understanding of Peter's dire straits, finding an eviction notice on his door, and they don't fare much better with trying to convince him to help with Charlie, but when they do offer him 500 bucks, he changes his tune and joins the cause. They determine a way to do a vampire test to prove to Charlie that Jerry isn't a vampire, Peter reminiscing on one of his films where it was due to not casting a reflection that he identified his undead antagonist, and settles on getting him to drink holy water. They politely phone Jerry first, informing him of their intentions, and after a few ground rules like no crosses, he agrees, chuckling with Billy about how 
how Charlie's friends are bringing him right into their midst. Arriving a bit late, Charlie is grateful for Peter lending a hand, but is remiss when he leaves his hunting kit in the car. Peter's saying they need to prove that he's a vampire first before slaying him. Charlie losing his lid knowing already that he's a vampire. Jerry emerges, chomping on an apple and rocking one hell of a sweater, introducing himself to Peter, calling him a big fan. But his attention is drawn to Amy, asking about these two other attractive people, planting a kiss on her hand and laughs, asking isn't that what vampires are supposed to do? And Amy is actually into it, calling him neat. A hand over the water, Peter saying he saw it being blessed himself. And Jerry is able to drink the vial without incident, which indicates Peter must have been fibbing about it actually being blessed, but for appearance purposes, the test worked, and Jerry couldn't be a vampire as far as they're concerned. Charlie tries one last time pulling out a cross that causes Jerry to back away, but Peter is done. Yet right before leaving, Peter pulls out his mirror, and to his surprise, Jerry doesn't cast a reflection. Now understanding he truly is a vampire, dropping his mirror in disbelief, but writes it off as just being clumsy. Charlie can tell that he saw something, and he admits about not seeing his reflection in the mirror and drives off. Jerry comes across a piece of the shattered mirror and realizes that Peter could be a problem as well, but first chooses to focus on Charlie's friends. They walk back home together, but Ed still doesn't believe that Jerry could be a vampire, proving his point by going down the alley by himself and screaming moments later, all just a big old prank, making a real big scene out of it to his amusement. But soon after, gets to see Jerry's true self, his omnipresent, seductive theme kicking in as he stalks Ed through the foggy alleyways. Reaching a dead end, there's only fog seen all around him. And taking one of their lesser known forms, Jerry emerges as a mist, cornering the frightened Ed. But he offers that he knows what it's like to feel different, and that no one will make fun of him anymore. All he has to do is take his hand. Ed shakily does so, Jerry rounding him up in his coat and biting him. His friends hearing him screaming, Amy assuming that it's just another prank. But Charlie isn't so sure. But before they can find him, Jerry is already on their tail, teleporting in front of them no matter where they try to run, sending them climbing through a nightclub's open window. Charlie going to phone the police. Meanwhile, the freshly changed Ed turns up at Peter's, duping him by saying there's a vampire out here. Peter lets him in, worriedly asking what they're gonna do. Ed turning the tables, what are you gonna do? Showing off his neck bites, telling him he used to admire him, but not anymore as now he knows he's a fake. Peter takes a cross to his forehead sizzling the flesh into a cross-shaped burn. He tries to look in the mirror, seeing nothing there, crying, what have you done to me? Telling him the master will kill you, and escapes through the window into the night. Looks like Peter is a part of this, no matter how much he wants to try to run away. Back at the club, the police are no help as usual, and Charlie too wants to ring Peter, Amy finally admitting that they paid him to be there, but he doesn't care as they have no other choice. Jerry then makes his triumphant entrance at the club in another killer sweater, looking through all the meat in the crowd crowd, locking eyes with Amy. She's instantly hypnotized. Other women try to reach out and touch him, but there's only one that he wants, pacing in a line closer and closer until popping up right in front of her, smirking, knowing she's already in his grasp. She steps out to join him for a dance, while Charlie is again denied by Peter, saying he can't help. Out on the dance floor, we're treated to most likely the most glorious dance seduction of all time. Amy at points catching herself, but can't break his spell. Going back and stroking his rear, the two getting extra close. Just as he's about to sink his teeth in, she pulls away and opens up her shirt herself, caressing his face and kissing his chest. Charlie finally notices what's going on, doing his best to break through the crowd, and grabs Jerry, telling him to let her go, but proves him wrong when going in for a kiss and she wants it too. He attempts to punch him, getting his hand grabbed, Jerry coolly telling him not to lose his temper because it's not polite. Charlie yells that he can't kill him here, Jerry instructing him to bring Peter to his place if he ever wants to see Amy again. A few bouncers attempt to step in and both get their asses handed to them, slashing one's throat and lifting up another dude, tossing him all the way across the dance floor. The place bursts into chaos, and Charlie is able to get Amy back for a moment, until again losing her in the shuffle. Watching helplessly as they roll away in Billy's Jeep, Ed in the back seat, pointing and laughing. Now Charlie really has no other option than to again plead with Peter to get his help, explaining that Jerry has her. But Peter is terrified, languishing that he's no vampire killer, and Peter Vincent is isn't even his real name. But Charlie doesn't give up, laying it out plainly that he can't do this alone. 
which is actually a pretty tender moment. While at Jerry's, it's time for more seduction, as you might imagine. First putting on a sexy mixtape before joining Amy, who wakes up confused, now donned in a long white flowing dress. She looks around the room, seeing various paintings of a woman, and Jerry explains that they're all the same woman, someone he knew long ago. She pipes up with questions about where Charlie is, but removing his shirt silences her as he sits down on the rug, and the real seduction begins. Amy again entranced, undoes her top clasp, exposing her neck, and Jerry goes in for the big chomp, the musical shredding climaxing, blood running down her neck as she moans. Charlie arrives at first at the house all by his lonesome, and it seems his attempts to appeal to Peter didn't work, until approaching the house, a hand grabs his shoulder. It's Peter, ready with his box of vampire killing instruments. But what about Bill? Charlie considers, Peter knowing that since he can walk around during the day, must be a human, so a simple gun will do the trick. They're about to just literally walk through the front door until Peter suggests going around back, but it's too late. Jerry knows they're here, the door opening on its own, beckoning them to enter. Jerry walks out to meet them in another iconic moment, really reveling in it. Welcome to Fright Night for real. Something about this always stuck with me from the movie, just fills me with excitement, like, oh damn, it's time for the big climax, let's do it boys. Charlie demands to know where Amy is, Jerry calmly telling them that she's up here. Just gotta get by me first. Peter holds up a cross, which only causes Jerry to laugh. As Ed mentioned earlier, you have to have faith for it to have effect, which Charlie luckily does, his cross causing Jerry to groan and back away, but gets an assist from Bill, choking Charlie and sending him sailing over the railing. And Peter flees through the front door. Ah, well, so much for that. He at least is only running next door in search of Charlie's mom, finding the phone line has been cut, and in her room, finds Ed in bed wearing a ridiculous red yarn wig. Luckily, Charlie's mom works nights, Ed reciting the note that she left about dinner being in the oven, hamming it up once again with the hearty mmm mmm. Here's dinner's in the oven. He goes to attack Peter, running into the halls, and Ed takes on a wolf form, snarling with glowing red eyes, and lunges at Peter, getting impaled by a wooden banister piece, falling to the first floor, limping away, severely injured. Peter goes down as he slowly and painfully reverts back to his human form, which is quite brutal as he slowly dies, reaching out to Peter for help, and ultimately it seems succumbing to his injury. This sequence in particular is full of so many effects, it's kind of insane. And just like Sarandon had to sit in a chair for nine hours, this actually is the actor that played Evil Ed, Stephen Jeffries, under this wolf makeup. Guess how long that shit took? 18 hours! And then they're not even done yet. You still gotta go through all the other forms until he finally goes back to being human. Again, took a lot of work for this very drawn out scene and absolutely worth it in my opinion. Meanwhile, Jerry tosses Charlie into the room with his turning lady love and tosses down a steak, telling him he's gonna need it soon and leaving them alone. Charlie flips her over, seeing she's already developing fangs. Charlie's screaming out in anguish to Jerry's sick amusement. Peter collects himself, retrieving the steak from Ed's body, forcing himself back to Jerry's, coming across where Charlie is, getting him to make some noise while he breaks down the door. And despite their distraction technique, Jerry again feels that they have another visitor. Peter thinks that it's too late to save her, but not if they kill Jerry before dawn, concluding that so far all the lore has followed the template from vampire films. Bill is waiting to tease them about being vampire killers, and Peter pulls out the gun, getting him point blank in the head, sending Bill rolling down the stairs. And, well that was easy, stupid weak humans. Jerry returns, Charlie sending him back with a cross. After seeing his manservant down below. But Bill ain't done yet, opening fire and shooting him again and again, the staircase becoming obscured in smoke. Charlie gets him in the chest, green goo pulling from the wound, his entire body proceeding to melt into sand before their eyes. Another quite exquisite practical effect moment, and proves that Bill was indeed not human either. There's been much debate over what Bill actually is, since he's probably not also a vampire, and could be a daywalker or half vamp, or indeed based on turning into the sand, actually a protector golem created by Jerry. Either way, he's definitely gone now. He's a big pile of goo on the floor. Well, now that's one down, but Amy is getting worse, Charlie finding her with full fangs and red eyes. Jerry again watching from outside. He commands her to awaken, instructing her to kill them both. She screams, now under Jerry's control, turning on Peter and snarling. He again holds up his cross, but as she's weaker and freshly turned, he has enough faith that causes her to shield her eyes. And then it's Jerry's turn, 
crashing through the stained glass window, and Peter again tries with a cross, but it's not enough to stop Jerry, reminding him that he needs to have faith. With new resolve, he again holds up the crucifix, and Jerry is stopped, gasping at what must be Peter's newfound faith after this frightful evening, noting the sun beginning to rise in the distance, hearing all the clock alarms going off at 6 a.m., their time growing short to save the day. Jerry gets a blast of sunlight turning into his bad form, attacking Peter, holding back its fangs with a stick, and scratches his face. Charlie manages to get it off, getting a deep bite in the hand, and goes back to Peter, thankfully again injured by the sun, glowing green mist flying off as he hurries to the basement and for the safety of his coffin. Our boys follow after, Peter busying himself with getting the coffin open, while Charlie runs into his newly vampired girlfriend, who has been given a whole makeover here. Woo-wee, that is some serious hair and, uh, well, uh, bust line as well. They actually did create an enhanced bust for Amy here, as confirmed by actress Amanda Beers, who even has brought the prosthetic to conventions, encouraging fans to touch her bust while getting autographs. Pretty hilarious. She asks Charlie, don't you want me anymore? Him keeping her at bay with a cross. She turns away, talking in her normal voice, reminding Charlie that he promised that he wouldn't let him get her. Turning back to her vampire form, and with a lot of sharp-ass teeth, known as the shark mouth form, this is probably one of the most memorable effects in the movie, even used as part of the haunting poster art, but apparently was only crafted two days before filming, and slapped together by the visual effects artist at the last minute. This really showing how sometimes the most creative and interesting things can be born out of not exactly ideal circumstances. Kudos on the team for this monstrosity, because it definitely is impactful, and haunted me for years as a kid. Just as she's about to devour Charlie, Peter gets the lock loose on the coffin, plunging the banister piece deep into Jerry's heart. He rises and yanks it out, tossing it away, hitting a window, and bringing in some deadly sunlight. Seizing the opportunity, Peter and Charlie try to crash as many windows as they can, letting in even more light. Jerry is paralyzed in place, smoke starting to emit from his body. He tries to get to his coffin, Peter on the ready, slamming the lid closed before he can get in. Charlie pulls down another curtain, letting in a full blast of light that launches Jerry across the room, emitting green steam and he begins to dissolve away. Wind surges through, leaving a weird winged skeleton creature that explodes. Yes, please. And apparently this weird little guy at the end was originally going to be used in Ghostbusters for the library ghost second form, but was discarded for being too scary. And with that, Jerry has been defeated. Amy is okay, and everything is back to normal, all hugging in celebration. Things go full circle back to the beginning in a kind of new normal. Amy and Charlie right back to making out on his bed with Fright Night on the TV. Hey, I guess he got a show back too. He's decided to put the vampires to rest for a while, winking to Charlie, and introducing this evening's alien-centric schlock, Charlie switching off the show, and catches a glimpse of glowing red eyes next door. And it looks like Charlie is back to his obsessive behavior, but he instead shrugs it off as nothing, hopping back into bed and making out. Got his priorities straight. But it appears things aren't quite over after all. Going back to the window, the eyes glow once more, hearing Evil Ed cackle, you're so cool, Brewster, as the titular theme song kicks in, one of my absolute favorite staple of 80s flicks. You gotta have a theme song with a title in it, and this one is a doozy. Also by the Jay Giles band, known for that one song, Centerfold, which you kids probably never heard of, but it was really popular. But the Fright Night theme is a wholly different ditty that's for sure. Fright night, 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 gonna be tonight. Another one I've been humming since working on this video. Tell you that much. Well, that's it for Charlie and Peter's first experiences with the undead in Fright Night. Although a few years later, a sequel was released that has become almost lost over the years since it came out only in a handful of theaters back in 1988 and was pretty much dumped to video everywhere else. Nowadays, you can't even find a legit copy on Blu-ray or anything. That's how unknown it has become. There we continue Charlie and Peter's facing off against vampires. This time it's Jerry's sister, Regine, as their foe, along with her vampire gang. And while not quite at the same level of the first one, with no Tom Holland returning, and they also wrote out Evil Ed and Amy, replacing them with new lackluster characters. It's still actually pretty good and worth a watch if you've missed it. I did find it on YouTube, so it's not necessarily impossible to find. Also, it's interesting to note that Fright Night Part 2 was directed by Tommy Wallace, known for editing John Carpenter's Halloween in the Fog, before branching off into directing with the much-maligned Halloween 3 season of The Witch, which I actually really like. Also, there were 
two remakes of Fright Night, the first in 2011 starring Anton Yelchin and Imogene Poots, along with Colin Farrell in the Jerry role. It did kind of miss the fun and adventurous spirit of the original, but as far as remakes go, it was actually pretty good. But the sequel to that one, which was weirdly more of another remake, is definitely much crappier, so avoid that at all costs. This concludes our look at the classic Fright Night, and thank you for joining us this evening. We'll be back again soon, coming to you from Foundflix Video with another excellent cult classic that you won't want to miss. Until then, stay tuned and keep physical media alive. Uh, yeah, why not? What did you guys think of Fright Night and its ending? How do you think it compares to the remake? What's your favorite 80s vampire flick? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time. I'll be here dancing to that Jerry tune. Be on your knees.